I'm going to jump in and start. Juanita, all your questions will be <laughs> all your questions will be answered eventually. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start. Uh, welcome to Making It Work, which is a panel on parenting that the alternate title was Kids, Lies, and Videotape, um, which I will hope there will be no lies in the panel. But I think we, everyone here has shown a willingness to be really honest and dump their purse, their proverbial purse. So I'm really looking forward to it. This panel is brought to you by Cameron Pictures which we have Cassie Cameron Yay. representing. And we have a special guest joining us, Heather McQuillan from Moms in Film Canada, who we'll bring on at the end. And um, we will talk for a while. We'll talk in for an hour and then open it up to um, questions. Like a YouTube star, it's like, put your questions in the chat. Um, I'm Sari Chellis. So I'm a writer, producer, and filmmaker. I live in Los Angeles. Uh, I uh, most recently uh, directed my first feature, American Woman, and I have two kids who are eight and 11. So I live with them and their dad here in LA. Um, and uh, I'm really excited to introduce everyone on this panel. But first, I'm going to start with a story, which is a kind of legend in our household, which is I had my daughter, who's my second child, uh, I got pregnant with her when I was in a room that was very demanding hours in which I was working weekends and I was pregnant with her first season and then I had an infant for a couple of seasons when I was running the room and then when the show finally ended she was sitting on my lap she was about two and a half and she looked up at me and she touched my cheek and she said I love you mommy have I always had a mommy <laughs> and so this story has like grown <laughs> Uh, the story has grown in our family to the point where she was like, this morning, she's eight now. She's like, are you sure you're qualified to lead this panel? <laughs> so that's where I'm going to start. Uh, I don't know if I'm an expert on juggling uh, children and work. Um, as Chassie once said to me, when you juggle so much, you're sure to drop a ball once in a while. And I've held on to that wisdom as some kind of uh, get out of jail free card, I guess. <laughs> so without further ado, let me introduce you to the panel. Uh, I'll start with Tassie, just randomly, since I just said her name. So Tassie is uh, the co-creator and co-showrunner of the forthcoming Lady Dicks, which is now going into production, actually in production on Monday. <laughs> Um, and you may have also know her from her multi-award winning shows, which include, uh, but are not limited to, Mary Kills People, Little Dog, 10 Days in the Valley, and Rookie Blue. Uh, she runs Cameron Pictures, which she created with her sister, and she's the mother of an elementary school daughter. Elementary school or middle school? She's going into grade six. She's almost 11. Wow. Um, Seth Sutherland, whose latest feature, Home Again, won the PATH Bath da Festival Choice Award in Los Angeles and earned him a DGC nomination for Best Director. And it's only the latest in an award-winning and amazing career as a writer and director um, in both TV and film that has spanned many years since his indelible debut, which I literally can remember shots from, of Love, Sex, and Eating the Bones. He's the father of three teenage girls with his collaborator and wife, Jen Jennifer Holness. Uh, Noelle Carbone, might as well wave, like it's like Hollywood Squares. <laughs> Noelle Carbone is a writer and producer, uh, most right now of Corner, which is about to to go into production as well. She wrote and produced on Saving Hope, Winona Earp. She started out on Rookie Blue and is a self-described inadvertent activist as one of the co-authors of the Lexa Pledge, which is a guideline for writers and creators um, who are committed to telling meaningful and responsible stories about LBGTQ plus characters. And she lives in Toronto with her partner and their two young children, quite young, I think. Two and a half and six, both feral. Yeah. <laughs> They're all fair. Juanita Storms is a writer and a producer for many shows, including Van Helsing, Bellevue. She started on Saving Hope and helped develop Corner. She's an, also an incredible actor, was the lead on my first television show, 11th Hour, um, where Tassie was actually my right hand man. There's a lot of sort of family tree here, I noticed, um, which might be pertinent to the conversation about starting families in this industry. And Juanita is a single mother by choice of twins who are elementary school age. 
And Mike McFadden is an actor and writer who started out in sketch comedy and improv and has written for shows such as How to Be Indie, Men with Brooms, Degrassi, as well as Ooh. animation, and most recently to uh, movies for YTV, This Can't Be Happening at McDonald Hall, which he wrote with Adam Barkin, who's also been in rooms with most of us, and um, The Whistler. And he is married with two kids, one a teenager and one a toddler, but had part of his career as a single dad. Um, and finally, Heather McQuillan, who's here from Moms in Film, and we will, um, and is the mother of a really adorable 20-month-old who made a cameo right before we started. <laughs> really cute baby. Um, so we have um, we have families of all shapes and sizes here on the panel, and uh, I'd just like to start out by hearing from you guys what your family is sort of like and what your arrangements are when you work. Um, Let's jump in with Noel. Oh, great. I get to go first. Yay. Um, so like I said, I have a six-year-old and a two-and-a-half-year-old. My partner, Bonnie, and I live in Toronto. Um, I did not carry my children. I procured my children. <laughs> um, so it was a bit easier, I think, transitioning back to work for me. But um, my first child was born on our last season of Rookie Blue, and uh, where Tassie was the boss and, and very generously was like have your baby have your time with your baby and any time and whenever you want to come back if you'll please come back come back so uh, I really got to enjoy that time without the stress of like what's next and then my son that's my daughter Taya my son Wyatt was born my first season uh, on Winona Earp and I'd never written genre before so it was a whole new kettle of I didn't know if I could but um, so I went in knowing that I would have to leave at some point to um, have this baby and then uh, come back. So again, Emily, who's a mom herself, like Tassie was very incredibly generous in, in saying like, you know, how many weeks, four weeks, seven weeks, what, what are we looking at here? And then just kind of making it work for me. So I wrote my first genre script ever with him strapped to my chest in a way that I didn't, sling was clearly not working properly. By the end of the draft, he was down by my knees, but you know, <laughs> we, figured, we figured it out. <laughs> and what about now, do you have child care do you split child care do you have daycare so when uh when i'm working full time we have patched together like we are really it takes a village and you know especially in the queer community chosen family is huge i know it's huge for all parents but we do have we had a nanny both of my kids had um full-time nannies for to bridge them from bonnie's mat leave until daycare they were eligible to go to daycare um, then they started daycare and my best friend, um, who's their godmother looks after them whenever we need someone to step in. My family's like four hours away, so they're not really able to help, but we've, we've suckered in as many people as we can sucker in to kind of help us make it work. Great. Um, let's go now to Seds, who described himself to me in an email. He said, we have a house of four, black, four strong black women and their driver. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Um, can you tell us about your sort of family and how you've managed uh, your childcare over the years? I guess also being working in conjunction with your with with Jennifer. Yeah, that's uh, it's been kind of interesting because we uh, some are it seems like we're always having a baby when we're about to go into production, and so that's been sort of our sort of history. Uh, with our first feature, we had a baby, Jen was pregnant. So we had like a 10 month old, Jen was pregnant. And then when we did the sound mix, uh, she was born during the sound mix period. Uh, so our second baby was born during the sound mix period. And so for that first child, uh, she, when she was in daycare, we were actually trying to shoot. Uh, we're, so we started prep and then we were trying to have our assistant drop her off to daycare. We'd drop her off in the beginning. And, and then we'd be those people at the end of the day at 6.30 and then we were just arriving. And so, you know, you're like, okay, this is not working out. So we got it, we had, we started with a nanny. And then, so whenever we had another child, uh, we would have to have, you know, you know, childcare during the, the shooting period, which is, can be quite, quite intense. And sometimes you actually have to get a night person as well. And so after we're not shooting anymore, we're, we're having a nanny and that's, uh, we existed off nannies for the most part. Um, and until uh, the, la the latest one, she, until she was about nine, then we stopped sort of having a nanny. 
And so that was kind of how we survived because again, there's two of us, um, but we have a small production company, we have staff, uh, and then we'll go into production and then all hell will break loose. Everything will sort of fall off the rails. And you're, you know, and the kids start to act out. Like that's one thing. We, whenever we get a show or whenever we get an opportunity to shoot something, we're like, yay. But then it's like, uh, the kids are gonna act out. They're gonna not see us. And you sort of feel guilty. So it's like this kind of a weird, like happy and, mm, you know, I'm inflicting damage on my children, but we need to do this damage in order to feed them. <laughs> so it's yeah. kind of a, a weird sort of guilt up thing that we all sort of deal with I'm sure but it's like it's it's a good thing and then it's like a not so good thing and so we're always trying to like figure out like well how can we actually spend the time how can we actually make this as painless as possible for them uh, and we try to try to build those things in and, and try to also do things on the weekend uh, so that they actually feel that they actually have parents that's um, you just made the whole panel worth it for me <laughs> Hang <on. laughs> just because to, to I also had after my first baby was born six weeks later my partner's first movie was greenlit in uh, across the country and it was one of those things where like we thought that we would sort of that there would be some kind of balance like we'd make a movie have a kid spend some time with the kid make a movie and then they all everything in our lives has it's happened at the same time. I got my dream room job in Los Angeles when I lived in Toronto and was pregnant six weeks later. They always have coincided and you begin to feel like, like it should be like two blessings together, make extra blessings, but instead it's like a seesaw. It's like one thing is up and the other thing is down. Um, great, I'm looking forward to talking more about that. Um, uh, let's just go to, I think, Bonita, I, your story is so hair-raising to me that I would love to hear it from your mouth. <laughs> well, um, I decided to change my career uh, path, um, my discipline, and go for, going from being an actor to being a writer. And I was at that, that scary age where I needed to also think about having a child. So I was going through fertility treatments and stuff. And finally I got pregnant and it ended up being with twins. Um, why, and so I was pregnant all through me retraining at the Canadian film center in the writing program. So that was great. Um, uh, I could spend that time being pregnant and, you know, sitting <laughs> and learning. Um, but it was, uh, so, but I didn't know what was coming next. I didn't know if I was going to actually get work right away or what was going to happen. So uh, financially, uh, I was not in a position to, um, pay, pay for a nanny. So by the time I did get my first job, which was really soon after the kids were born, actually, I'd say I had daycare spots for them through the Toronto Children's Services. I managed to get two spots up the street and I was on a subsidy. So I paid zero that first year. And it's a sliding scale. If you can get in the system, you can have that access, but it's very hard to get in the system. I think people put, took pity on me because I was a single mother with twins. <laughs> I got two spots at the same place. So I started working on Saving Hope and then and when the kids were about eight months old, so I was packing, you know, bottles of formula and pureed food and, and stuff to take to the daycare. And I had a babysitter who would pick them up, a young woman, wonderful. And then two young women who would tag team, picking them up for me, taking them home, making them dinner. I would get home. I'd feed them the last bottles. See this too. So I feed them like this in a little rocky chair and then, you know, burp them, put them down and cry, go out, go out into the living room, cry for a little while to decompress, and then, and then have a power nap, and then eat dinner and get back to work. Because as we all know, when we get home as writers, we're not, um, we're not just watching, you know, TV or enjoying our family life as much as we would like. Often we're reading material, getting prepared for notes, preparing for the next day, any research we need to do which I'd like to come back to later, which is what is the, um, what is the actual job of being a writer in television? It's not, uh, it's not a nine to five 
thing necessarily. It's, it feels that way and some days and other days it feels like you're working weekends, you're working nights just to make sure that you're really on it, you know? So um, the kids now are nine and we're in Vancouver to be closer to my aging mother. So there's always that dependent that I might have soon. Luckily, I have a brother to share that with. That's a whole other conversation of like, you know, our parents get older and then suddenly they're like our children and, and I've got young children and uh, I'm just, <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping that the system will improve after COVID and anyhow. So they are in elementary school um, and uh, I've always had daycare before and after school so I could drop them off at seven or 6.30 and pick them up at seven. And I've always had people I've, I've paid to do the pick up and the drop off when I'm working. But because I'm not working like all year long, I've never paid a permanent person. So I've always had to kind of pound the pavement and find the next person who's available, interview them. It's really hard to find the time, interview them. Um, uh, people have had family members die on me and they're gone and suddenly I need somebody new. And, um, you know, and as I was working up, like just in terms of um, my job at work, as I was going from a junior to, you know, working my way up in the business, um, in the early days, I wasn't making enough money to actually pay anybody full time. So I was constantly worried something would fuck up was constantly, constantly on edge. And I realized very early on that I needed to not talk about it much because I didn't want my showrunners to worry that I wasn't going to be there, you know? Um, so uh, it's been, uh, I have to say, um, not having a partner, but I think even people with partners struggle <laughs> to find the right balance between um, making sure that someone is always there for the children so that you can be at work. And I think COVID-19 is gonna change the way we work now, which is gonna be very good for parents. If we can work from home and stay in touch through these types of apps, then I can have a sick child lying beside me on the couch here and I can take a break if I need to clean up their vomit. Um, uh, I, I will say that it hasn't been easy and I've, and I've um, I, uh, I, there were times I felt like I wish I had more power in the industry so that I could make the decisions about how we work. For example, I wouldn't work 15 hours a day. I wouldn't work anybody, not crew, not actors, not anybody. At, at work, I feel like production makes it almost impossible for us to actually have um, the freedom to be to have a life, whatever that may be, children, elderly people, <laughs> you know. I worked with a man once who, um, who was a very, very experienced man, so he was able to negotiate this in his contract. He had a very, very sick wife, and she needed full-time, round-the-clock care. And so she had a, he had a home nurse for her, and he managed to get it in his contract that he doesn't work past five so that he could go and relieve the woman who was looking after his wife. And she was, you know, and this was really a heart-wrenching situation. Um, and I kind of always felt like, whoa, that's way worse than what I have. Like my situation is beautiful. I get to see kids, they're lovely, they're my life, you know? <laughs> but in the end, it's the same kind of situation. It's like, there's a lot of, uh, you have to kind of work your way up into the business for long enough in order to actually, um, ask somebody for this dispensation to be able to leave on on a sudden or to be able to uh be there for your kids to put them to bed at night and um and something i, I want to talk about later two things that you raised that i think are really important to talk about which is when how open are you with people about these issues when you're working for them and and two just that question of like of the power not only to you know dictate the terms of your working situation but the power to pick and choose between people who will understand it like working with people who will and jobs that you just need or want um, that might not accommodate it so let's go to mike and then we'll come back to those are great issues to uh to raise um mike do you want to just give a overview of your 
Yeah, uh, my situation, um, I live in Toronto with uh, my wife, Christine, who's a, an actor. Uh, and we have my uh, son from my first marriage. He's 16 and we have him half, half time. He sort of comes back and forth. And then we have our, uh, we have our daughter who's three and a half. Um, you'd think if your kids are so far apart, they wouldn't fight over the same stuff. But <laughs> <laughs> they totally do. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's amazing to have a teenager and and be just out of diapers. I, I when I read yeah. that in your bio, I was like, wow, respect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's 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 pretty cool. Um, and uh, so yeah, the um, my. First, uh, my first marriage ended when my son was very young, around two, and then uh, I was uh, on my own with him half time again uh, for about five or six years there. So it was, uh, you know, I'd have him for a couple of days, he'd go to his mom's for a couple of days, I'd have him for a weekend, and then repeat. And so it was a 50-50 split in terms of uh, the time. Um, and so it was up to me to try and negotiate my, I, I, so when my son was about three, uh, I went to the Canadian Film Center. I was retraining from being an actor playwright to, to go to, to, into TV. And I just happened to luck out the hours that the, you know, the, the guest showrunner at the CFC while I was there wanted to keep worked with the daycare hours in terms of when I had to do pickup. And then the, over the next few years, I was working in, you know, live action team comedy. Um, so, you know, uh, working on staff, you're in the studio, they're shooting downstairs, like it's, you know, the potential for longer hours were there, but because the casts were, you know, underage, there was sort of a cap on just how crazy long a shoot day could go, but it was still well beyond what, you know, when the six o'clock that I had to pick up my son from, from daycare was, you know, still hours earlier than some of those days would end. And that was just, and that, and it was, it was a real mix of me being able to go, Hey boss, I can stay as late as you want. And then other days being like, I have to leave at five. <laughs> I told you that already. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and it was a real, in terms of like the childcare thing, it was a real, there was no consistency. Like you, it's, you can't, it's hard to hire somebody to say, can you pick my son up next Tuesday and Friday from daycare? But one of those days, take him to swimming lessons first and then bring him to my house and, it's all going to add up to three hours here and two hours there. Like it, it was, it was just a patchwork of, you know, a service we have here called nannies on call. I don't know how widely that is where you, if you're really desperate and even posting to Facebook doesn't get you some childcare <laughs> help, you can like get somebody sort of short nurse that way. And um, that's an interesting thing because one of the things is you're, you're also an employer and you're also, if you're working with a nanny or a service, like you're, you're providing a job for someone else and the, and so your inconsistency and your need to be nimble that our industry breeds trickles down to somebody else's job as well there's sort of yeah it's a really interesting and this was a this was a thing where it was like uber for childcare, where it was like going to be a different person every time so it wasn't my favorite way to solve a child care problem right. as it was but my first um my first bosses uh john may and suzanne bolts were wonderful they sort of let me go early like it was like Monday Tuesday that I could leave at five and you know I had to maybe brave a bit of a gaunt like leaving going through the production office of someone making a comment about bankers hours as I slunk out but uh we, it was it was that bit of concession that really made it all possible and then um and then uh so over the years though there's been uh there's been more like story summits instead of writing rooms that are staffed full-time at least for Canadian comedy and I've written more animation and there's been more uh, room uh, series have had shorter orders like I went from working on shows with 26 half hours to you know I'm working on uh, I've been working on Jan season one with six episodes yeah. and you know season two premiering this fall is uh, is eight so it's it, it and that's a lot of working from home so that it's the childcare aspect has gotten easier and then now uh, I've been uh, with my wife since we got married in 2013 and so that that's a whole different childcare calculus where our daughter who's three is in uh, daycare two days a week. And then the rest of the time, her and I just, we just swap off whoever needs to be doing what we can basically, we both can't be working at the same time unless uh, our daughter's at daycare, like either one of them, we figure, we just figure out like I'll be the a parent for the morning 
and then we'll switch at lunchtime and then you have her and then so that's how we do our work and then we can both get work done in the evenings after she goes to bed but then throw my son in for a few days into the mix and it's some there's sometimes those days where i'm trying to figure out okay what i'm i actually want to google activities for a 16 year old and a three-year-old <laughs> <laughs> that we can do together. I'm, actually, I'm on an email chain, which I will forward to you. <laughs> pandemic email chain of like all the things that you might possibly be able to do. We, we found a playground next to a skate park. It worked out pretty good. Oh, perfect. <laughs> yeah. Um, great. Thank you. That, again, a lot of really interesting points there, which is partly that you've decided what to work on has grown like the proverbial tree around the fence, like around your sort of bottom line of needs for, for um, that's really interesting that you found ways like in animation with shorter orders that, that make it more possible. Yeah. Um, but Tassie, let's hear from you and, um, and uh, yeah. Um, wow, it's so interesting to hear all these stories. I just like, and Juanita, Jesus. <laughs> I mean, cause in, in, in contrast, I was really lucky, I guess, because I, um, while I had always been pretty private as a writer in my 30s, by the time I was running the first show I was running, which was Flashpoint, I was actively trying to get pregnant and having a hard time. So I was going through IVF. So any kind of privacy or hiding my struggle became, you know, became completely hopeless when I'm having to ask random people to shoot me up with fertility drugs in the washroom at the production office of Flashpoint. Uh, so I suddenly I'm like, okay, well here, here's where I'm at. And by the time I was pregnant, uh, I was in development on Rookie Blue. So, and so it was always built into that paradigm that I was pregnant when I was show running and that they still wanted me to do it. And so um, I was lucky because I was able to, you know, I even left the series uh, the first season a month early because I had a baby and of course these assholes like Noel ended up calling a strip club after me in my absence on the what show. What happens when you leave? All sorts of hijinks. I was also pregnant and I was put on bed rest and Tassie put a bed in the writer's room for me. <laughs> So I could lie. It's the best job of my life. I came in whenever I wanted to and I lay in bed and just pitched from the bed. Do you remember that? And then the next round, we would go in your office and pump together. And I remember like, that. Yeah, it would be like, <laughs> I know. It'd be like, they would have disappeared. And then you there first. And then we did the sequence where, like, would you do, 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 do. <laughs> it, was, it was so intense. It was, it was really intense. So I, I, my first season of Rookie was when I was pregnant. And then, I went back to the second season and Semi and I were waddling around and, and <laughs> it was, and trying to be like bosses and looking like, and yeah, of course, no idea what we were doing and the show was new and it was really hard. And, and then the, if I thought that was hard, the second season when I had a three month old was probably the hardest the time of my life as a parent. Um, so I had a nanny full time uh, that I hired when Sadie was three and I went back to work and uh, she was the first in a series of wonderful Filipina women that saw me through uh, till Sadie was about seven or eight. Um, so I always had a either Ruth or her friend or her other friend with me for those years. Uh, I split from Sadie's dad when Sadie was three and so I was still in Ricky Blue so then I was a single parent doing this. Um, which I, I thought it couldn't get harder and then it did with that for a while and uh but thank god for the child care and that's where i feel so lucky and in especially when we're i'm hearing from Juanita, where i'm like at least i was able to say i have to leave i have to be home for my kid i have to pump and i can afford to hire a full-time caregiver for when i'm not there at the same time i i was also very reluctant to be one of those people that's like i'm going to adopt a male paradigm of show running um, and stay till seven or eight or nine at night to prove something. So I wasn't interested in, in, I wanted to be home at a reasonable hour. And that was a challenge to make that happen, but I've tried really hard when I can. And now it's easier because she's older and she doesn't want babysitters. Although I do have an assistant, an assistant 
And if Sadie, if you're watching, she's just an assistant. She's not your babysitter. <laughs> uh, and um, she helps. She helps not babysit Sadie sometimes. Um, and COVID's another whole shit show. So that's my story. Yeah, I mean, I, I sort of, COVID is like both magnifying and then as Vanita said, possibly maybe redressing some of these issues. So let's set it sort of aside for a second, but I do wanna talk about it if we have time. I that's It's just fascinating. I mean, I think something that's really worth pointing out is uh, one thing I have often said to young women who have approached me about questions of motherhood and, and television careers, and I'm always like, as hard as it is, it's never affected my success <laughs> or my ability to do work. What it affects is everything else. Like I, my experience has been like, I've had babies, I've had young children, I've had those issues and I've been able to keep it together at work. And all of you hearing your stories, you've done so much in these crazy situations, like with with young children, with pregnancies, with children needing care or whatever, you've managed to do so much and change careers and make movies and start companies and run all these shows. What I found is that everything else gets lost. Like everything else goes away. Like I, I sometimes think of the, the season that I did when I had a newborn baby and a toddler and I somehow would go to work and function totally fine, uh, it's easier in writer's rooms, I think, or on sets than it is to sit at home and write in those situations, especially if you're sleep deprived. But I would go and I would function really normally and I would come home and see my children and nothing else happened during that time in my life. Like my friendships, you know, my, my other relationships, my relationship with my partner, all of these things got very like, very peripheral vision for me. I am, um, I, I, pulled this moderating job because I sent on the email chain a quotation that I wanted to read here, um, which is from this, uh, it's from an author named Claire Dederer, uh, who wrote a piece in the Paris Review. Um, she's the author of a book called Love and Trouble, which is about getting into trouble. And, and, and uh, anyway, so this is a quotation that really meant something to me. She says, maybe as a female writer, you don't kill yourself or abandon your children, but you abandon something, some nurturing part of yourself. When you finish a book, what lies littered on the ground are small broken things, broken dates, broken promises, broken engagements, and other more important forgettings and failures. Children's homework left unchecked, parents left untelephoned, spousal sex unhad, those things have to get broken for the book to get written. I, I I feel like I like read that quote and it's about writing a book, but I, I really grabbed onto it because there's so many fails around making it work. And I personally like feed like a vampire on the story of other people's fails. So I want to hear yours. <laughs> I feel like I feel like it's so important to I, I think share that while it might look like it's going great from the outside, if it does, there it that is a sort of veil over a lot of chaos and and problems. Um, I uh, and I'll just I'll just start with my well. That's if it wasn't bad enough that my daughter was like, Do I, did I always have a mommy? <laughs> but uh, I you know I had. Um, I, my first feature, uh, which I worked for many, many years to get off the ground, and I had it all figured out that it was going to prep during the summer. My kids would come for prep, then they would go home to LA to school because it was going to shoot in Canada. I would remain and shoot and everything would go great. But of course, it didn't happen on that schedule. In fact, it happened on the opposite, so that I was faced with the potential that I would go to Canada for prep and they would be in school and then I would shoot and not see them anyway because of the hours on set. And it would be this huge amount of time that I would be apart from them and I wasn't willing to do that. So I took them out of school and brought them to Canada to shoot the feature. And then they went home for the summer and I had, they, we have a uh, Manny, we have a young man who came with us to watch them, but my partner got in a room at the last minute, so the kids missed school. I was separated from their dad. I was living with the babysitter and the kids, and then they went home when I shot and sort of never got to witness the thing that it was all for. Um, 
and it caused a huge amount of chaos. It blew up our lives. And I was, I, it, in the end, it all worked out. But while I was doing it, I really felt like, talk about homework, go unchecked. I had no idea when I was shooting what was happening. And I would, you know, I, I realized after my first day of shooting, I was like, oh, that's the first time I didn't think at all about my children for like eight years, <laughs> like for a whole day. I forgot that I was a mom. And I kind of came out of it and was like, oh my gosh, and I would have these bubbles of anxiety in the middle of set and think like, wait, what are my children doing? Are they safe? Are they, are they happy? What are they like right now? Um, it was so difficult. And one of the, we got a number of questions from people who were planning to attend the, uh, the panel about travel. And um, anyway, so I'm interested, I'm gonna randomly pick uh, sets. <laughs> who also, just what, what falls through the cracks and how do you cope with that and how does time uh, play that out? Um, any number of things are going to fall through the cracks. And I think that we kind of have to be honest and sort of not be too hard on ourselves um, about that because like our first child, um, we were having trouble getting pregnant and Jen had a hormone imbalance. And then so we just had a, a, a drug sort of fix it through uh, just sort of a, a therapeutic. And it was um, all of a sudden she was pregnant. And then uh, when we had the baby, uh, the baby was born without amniotic fluid. So it was like, whoa. Uh, so she had very dry skin for the first three years of her life. And so we'd have to slather on steroid cream, slather, you know, and it was like this kid was like just wailing all the time. And so she like, she's very, you know, she's now 18, you know, but those first three years were really rough, um, especially on Jen, because, you know, there's a whole guilt thing about, you know, having a child and it's from your body and all these other things that I'm not having those feelings. I'm having the feeling of shut this kid up. I want to sleep because I got to go shoot in the morning. Um, but I'm also like, it's, you're also slathering on and you, you, you just, as a, as a parent, you're feeling guilty about the, you know, the pain that you're inflicting on the kid or, or trying to, trying to help your child um, in some way. So there's that, like just the, the physicalness of the child, if there's any kind of problems or issues. Um, and so that's one thing like that's always top of mind, always top priority. So going to different doctors and doing a lot of medical research and doing all that shit online uh, and actually asking a lot of questions because, um, you know, sometimes, they don't, you know, doctors and, and medical professionals don't listen to black women. So if Jen is going into a situation, you know, I'll try to be there. Um, and, you know, she's an advocate for herself, but it's like, it's like we all have to sort of say, okay, well, um, this is what is happening and we are not imagining this. So whether that is, you know, uh, in the schools as well, like, um, you know, the first child, Rain, she came home at SK saying, I hate math. And I was like, what? <laughs> you hate math? It's like... Hey. It's doing pattern recognition, like, what are you <laughs> talking about? Like addition, like, and so we realized that um, we had totally started our, you know, early reader and just really hooked on phonics and did all that, that stuff, but we didn't talk about number or numeracy at all. So we were like, uh, went to the school and the school, the teacher was like a very good teacher. And she's like, um, well, some kids don't get math. Some kids just don't get math. And I was like, uh, what? <laughs> You know, I just, I was like, that's, that's not an answer. So we had, like, I actually like researched and found, you know, uh, you know, what I could do or what we could do as a family. So, you know, started teaching her math uh, in the house. Um, and it was like very hard in the beginning and, and I was doing more writing. So I was actually at home a lot more. Um, and as she grew older, I did a lot more directing for hire. And so I was out of the house for months at a time. If it was like a long form thing, like I'd be out in New Brunswick for, you know, months. And so the, um, the, the, the whole thing of it is those falling through the cracks. Um, this was something that I, I was really, imp you know, intent on not having our daughters not be strong in math. Uh, because math is a great sorting filter through high school and it closes a lot of doors if you are not, uh, if you are not, 
you know, good at it. So, you, oh, sorry. Did, I wondered if you felt at, like when you were getting on top of that, did you have work stuff that was falling through the cracks? Like, did it feel like that seesaw balance? Always, always. And there's always something falling through the cracks. Like you, there's only so much time that you have. And luckily there were two of us and we did have a nanny at the time. So we could actually offload some things like the, the dishes got washed, the clothes got washed, you know what I mean? And, and so the, the food got made, but if, you know, like, but that was only Monday to Friday. Um, but the thing is like, sure, lots of stuff got left by the wayside, but you would stay up all night and, and try to finish it. So the girls all, you know, in terms of that math and early intervention, we all did that and then just made sure that they were on top of it. So they're all very good students, but we had to focus on that. Uh, and then whenever we got a show, it was like, you know, we'd have to get to tutors. Um, somebody had to do the, the, the work with them. And that was a, a thing. And we, or we'd have like, you know, uh, some kids around the neighborhood, like, Hey, just, can you do <laughs> like older kids, just do some homework with these kids. Uh, through, through, you know, we'd have to figure out a solution for that particular season, like whatever it was a show or was it a particular six months or three months or whatever it is, you know, like when I, like what you're saying is like, you'd have to figure out a solution for right now. Uh, and you know, it's like, yeah, you know, and you just have to figure it out. Part of the challenge I think of this industry is no two jobs are the same, even if you're in charge of them, like the, somehow the demands of the actual thing are changing all the time which again ripples down through you know school arrangements through childcare arrangements that you have to keep reinventing the wheel every time and it took me several cycles to notice that i thought that i would like figure out a way that our family worked and a way that we interacted with childcare but then you know it 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 actually has been reinvented every couple of years also as tassie was saying for the kids needs i am um, we need a well, i want to hear something that slipped through the cracks because um, well, I certainly didn't date, date any men for, the, for numerous years. I mean, that was the last fucking thing on my mind was, <laughs> you know, people talk about, oh, you know, you have to look after yourself too. And it's like, <laughs> I think the <laughs> cognitive therapy workbook was my, my meat. Yes. Uh, <laughs> So um, I mean, that's a really interesting, that's a really interesting thing. People are always saying, make sure you take care of yourself and you have time for yourself. And, and I, it's one of those things, it's like, really? Because I, I, I remember once my husband saying to me, you know, why don't you go have a massage? And I was like, do you know how stressful it would be to get a massage right now? I'd be lying there, not getting anything done while someone's touching me. <laughs> Okay. Uh, yeah. um, I would say actually things slipping through the cracks has not really been my my big uh, uh, issue I think if you would like if you want to move on to somebody else in the panel I I, I would say that uh, I put my nose to the grindstone in terms of um, becoming a parent on my own I accepted the fact that I was going to be parenting on my own um, and uh, you know um, so I didn't actually try, like, I haven't been very ambitious in terms of like, um, you know, how, how can I go to Banff and, and take the showrunners program? I mean, I, I, so I just accepted that I was going to be a staff writer. Uh, for a while, I've been working on my own uh, material, you know, things in development and stuff. So I have all the time I need to myself. It's very luxurious to get paid and work from home. Uh, pick my own kids up, you know, I'm, I don't know that there's uh, any, the only thing that's fallen through the cracks is, um, like I say, my personal life, like you were saying, Sammy, it's like everything else just kind of, it was all I could do to just try and put, you know, get myself to work, be bright eyed and bushy tailed. And in the early days, that was really hard, really hard. Uh, because as you know, babies, this whole proverb sleep like a baby is an absolute fallacy it's, not at all true. it's really really like i had um uh thanks to a lot of wonderful people i know i i was given some money uh, early in the early days for a nighttime doula so she would give the kids bottles which of course i was trying to avoid bottles but i was pumping and uh you can't feed twins it's very hard 
from your own breasts all the live long day. It's, it's very, very, very difficult. I know Morwen Brebner has done it. That's the only person I know who's done twins. <laughs> she all has twins. No running. Yeah. She said she felt like a dairy cow for like, yeah. like two years. So it wasn't like it was super fun. <laughs> yeah. I would say that the only thing that's fallen through the cracks for me is my, um, my ambition to, to kind of, um, be in LA pitching ideas to, um, to go to Banff and, and be part of these wonderful, it sounds like an amazing time. I could really do with the drinks too. You know, I mean, I, I, I can't really, I, I've gone once talking about travel to, uh, Halifax for a week to work on a show. And it was so amazing because I was able to lock down a nanny who's been a nanny for people I know. And she's sat for me before and she's like the child whisperer and the safest, most experienced 60 year old woman ever. And she literally just stayed in my house with my kids. And I, a lot of my salary went to that. Right. But it was worth it for me to get a new experience, to work with new people to, and uh, frankly, it felt great. The kids were old enough that we missed each other, but it wasn't tragic. And so I'm kind of thinking that, that as they get older and as I get more experience and I'm less freaked out, things get a lot easier. I will say that. I mean, I don't have a teenager. Uh, I don't have a baby. I have two nine-year-olds and they're all, they both kind of luckily are hitting landmarks at the same time, which makes it a little bit easier for me. And I will say, that sometimes I've wondered if doing it on my own and paying people to help me has actually been a little bit easier than dealing with co-parenting -co uh, issues or just dealing with, you know, um, the emotionality of, of co-parenting, which I, I don't have on, on my plate at all, at all. I, I'd, love to, I'd love to bring that to Tassie too, who you relocated with, with your child for, a year more than a year to los angeles and and so you've and you've done a lot of traveling and juggled that i'm like that's another thing that we've gotten a lot of questions about is like how you manage both travel and i would say also time in production which whether or not you're traveling as we know those hours can mean that you you know are never around for whatever period of time right well tr going to la to do 10 days in the valley was really really daunting um uh because i had to take sadie out of school and school for her there she's also because she's a november baby she's younger than the american kids so there were only three schools in la who would take her into the grade that she was supposed to be in like so there was no public school alternatives or whatever so i so what i did is i hired a education consultant and paid her ten thousand bucks us to find me those three schools that would accept her and then based on those schools, we went down with her. I, I brought her dad down too, um, aware that he was, I was gonna have to, he was gonna have to come down to LA as well if it was gonna work. He wasn't gonna not see her for six months and I wasn't gonna not see her for six months or eight months or whatever. So we went down and, and she toured the schools. She picked the school from that. We picked where we were gonna both live. We had to find two houses near each other, near the school. Um, you know, it was, it was, two rental cars sitters you know, i mean it was uh i like i think i maybe made about four dollars <laughs> i was gonna say so like, <laughs> it was hilarious like it was it was completely like lost money it was just making doing that show I, I the expenses of carrying two households and and a private school and all that stuff was shocking so, but it was so worth it and it was great for us as co-parents, you know, and it was incredibly gracious of, of her dad to come with me and I was, he picked up a lot of slack and it was really, we made it work. It wasn't easy, but we made it work. Um, and traveling, you know, you have to rely, if you, if you have a co-parent or, or parents who are able to help you or friends or I rely on my sister a lot. Um, I rarely pay people to stay in the house. I wish I had somebody like that, but you know, I, I really try and keep and nurture my friendships with people who like her. <laughs> <laughs> so that they'll take it's her. definitely true. I think that that uh, it's happened a number of times to me that it was the same with directing my movie where it was a zero sum game. It was like, if I want to have this experience and make this thing and tell this story, uh, 
and and I want my you know my kids to be taken care of and to remain close or you know in touch or whatever with their lives during this then the thing that falls away is going to be like making the big money on it yeah. or like or like making the sort of it, it really in a funny way it purifies the question of what you want and what you want to do right it really like can can make you look at a job and say is this worth it for what i'll have to do to accommodate and make it work and like is this something that i'm really driven to do um but it's it's an interesting it's interesting because that it, that you say you said all that and then you said and it was totally worth it right it was totally worth it you guys had a ball when you were here Great time. we had except we never saw you because you were so busy <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. But um, yeah, and I mean, in, in terms of falling through the cracks, like everything else, you know, that I fantasize, like I have almost sexual fantasies about having an organized purse or, or work bag. Like, like I have, like, like I can't find anything at anywhere. I, I, I have, I oh, yeah. mean, and, and self care, self help, like beyond therapy to stop me from jumping off a of balcony is, it's like, uh, like the, people are like, you just got to meditate. And I'm like, really? And, and okay. And are you doing your back exercises? And I'm like, nope. Like, <laughs> you should have a smoothie. And I'm like, fuck you. Fuck you and your well, smoothie. I think also that the job of, in particular, writing, but also show running or whatever, is never over, right? So it's a really big question about how you, like, you know, if you get the kids to bed and you've sort of done that part of it and been there for that, then do you organize your purse? Or in my case, it's my linen closet. Or do you write more and finish that script or polish that script or read that script that's sitting in your inbox? It's sort of the work in this field never is done really, right? And so carving out time, you know, carving out extra time outside of family and relationships becomes just an, another thing on the to-do list sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, Mike, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, I'm interested in like that sort of idea of accommodations and what gets pushed out. Uh, well, and in terms of like regr you know, regrets and things that fall through the cracks, I would say uh, not so, not, not on a particular job, but sort of generally especially my career when it was my son and I on our own and he was, you know, four or five, six, and I was working on, on various shows. Um, I really felt like I was like, I was always amazed, like so amazed. I hear about like other writers where it's like, Oh, I was, I've been on this show for the six months, but in my spare time, I wrote a new sample and I just be like, how? like, when I'm, so when I, when I'm on the show, it's kind of like, if I'm not sleeping, I'm probably working on something. Uh, you know, I've always been one of those TV writers that you, they say that, you know, you have to be able to write fast to write for TV. And I feel like I, I'm just over the line <laughs> to be able to have a career in TV. I'm just fast enough. <laughs> but I mean, it's, it's meant that, I, you know, I've relied on, you know, a lot of my out of work time or not in the production office, out of the writing room time to write and to, to, to not fall behind. And, sometimes really late nights and sometimes even pulling all nighters. And it's like, Oh, I finally finished this draft, but I'm not going to send it at four 30 in the morning because <laughs> I'm going to see that and think I'm a psychopath or like, I'm not reliable, which I, uh, I'm going to hang on to it for three more hours. And then it'll look like I'm an early riser. And <laughs> I'm just really on the ball and I'm a keener. Um, I and love so, it. I love you have those internalized judgments, which are like, which, and they're probably accurate, but that like, we have this perception that like, if you get up early and, and put the touches on your script and send it in, you're good. <laughs> but if you yeah. stay up late and do it, that's bad. Like, that's really interesting. There's so many things like that that are sort of unexamined. Yeah. And it was definitely a case where I, I felt like I was, those years, the things that I regret and the, the real trade-off that happened uh, was because the, you know, I feel like I, I'm proud of the scripts that I handed in, but I felt like there were whole years there where I wasn't, my focus wasn't on raising my son. It was on keeping my son occupied. Right. So it was, you know, and it was like, you know, it was like 2007, 2008, everyone was like, wow, look how much our kids love screens. 
these iPhones are so intuitive. It must mean it's great for them. So it felt like it was a lot of, yes, watch a whole season of Clone Wars this weekend. That, that's a great way for me to get this script done. And I feel like, you know, in retrospect, I wish I'd found other ways to get what I needed to do done. Um, and yet at the same time, you know, I enjoy a lot of like multiple layers of privilege in my life and also in, in my career. And one of them would just be, you know, how low the bar is for dads, especially if you're a, a single dad or a halftime single dad like me. Like, you know, I was living in squalor because I couldn't keep up with the dishes and I had, you know, script pages everywhere. And my son was, you know, being raised, he, you know, he was being radicalized by, by YouTube instead of being raised by me. And, but, you know, dad on their own pushing a stroller, like, you know, people are like, you're, you're a hero. Well, look at you, these modern dads, like you're just a cut above. And I'm like, I'm literally <laughs> pushing the stroller. Like, so, and I guarantee yeah. you have not singled out any, any of the women on the street for just <laughs> pushing a stroller with a child in it. It's, it's, that's fascinating. It puts me in mind if there's like a, a um, op-ed piece in the New York Times by a woman who's a screen time expert and who does like seminars about screen time and managing screen time and digital citizenship. And there was a COVID article where she just wrote, she literally was like, I'm eating a whole pile of crow right now. I had no experience. I was coming from a honking whack of privilege, I think is a direct quote, <laughs> when I shamed you and you know, scolded you and lectured you about screen time because they did not understand because up until this pandemic, I did not stay home with my kids and understand what that was. And it was like, I read it and I was like, good for her. She literally was like, I'm checking my privilege right now and I am apologizing in the New York Times for my entire career. And then she was like, now that we got that over and my daughter's in front of YouTube, let's talk about like screens and what it really means or whatever. And I was like, I thought that was such a great, brash brave thing because you know people are i think experiencing in the quarantine you know a rethink of those things that that someone like you you know you're you're expressing regret for it but you know is it really that bad isn't it i think important for your kid to see that you like worked and thrived as you raised them it's it's, it's anyway Thank you. That's that's great. So Noelle, let's get to you because I want to, before we open up to questions, I have one more question for everyone, but Noelle, I really want to hear um, about about you and what got sort of squished out to the side as you. Uh. <laughs> um, I love, like love the job. We, even when it's hard, even when it's horrendous, I love it. And I do feel guilty about that a lot of the time because I talk like the stress of the job is the stress of the job and it doesn't necessarily make you a good parent to be driving home from the production office and get 15 emails of this is all the things that are on. These are all the things that are on fire and then walk into your house. And how do you leave that in your phone, put your phone away, but you can hear it buzzing in the corner <laughs> and you're meant to be part of the solution. And it's why, at least at this level, why I'm there is meant to be pro helping problem solve these things. And I'm trying to like be present for my kids and like, you know, play with them and ask, and you come home at the worst time. Like <laughs> when you come home at like six ish between five and like seven, it's just, you, it's like chaos. The hour. Yeah. Oh my God. And everyone's like screaming and jumping in it. And they're, one of them's always naked, if not both of them. And you're just and like my, you know, my partner's hair is like, Oh my God, I'm so glad you're home. And then you have to jump right into the parenting with kind of none of the context for anything that was happening today. But one of them has a scratch across his face and you're pretty sure it was the other one. But like, and then you're just literally like, I'm just going to throw you in the bath. And then I'm going to stare at you, put my phone outside and stare at you and remember that like, this is actually why what makes all that other stuff. It makes me better at all the other stuff too. And so I, I took con I'm constantly like, I'm doing this wrong because I shouldn't love the work part as much as I love, you know, and obviously I love my kids more than I love my job, but I get like, in some ways I feel like I'm better at the job. And so in a weird way that triggers part of my brain that goes like, oh, that, that work is more rewarding in a way because you're better at it. 
And as not the primary parent, like my partner, Bonnie is, I would say, has always been the primary parent. It's hard for me to, it's a lot harder for me to switch gears, I think, than it is um, for her. And she had this thing of like, I come home, I change clothes, and now I'm ready to go in this other mode. And so I just had to kind of learn the thing of like, put that, you know, put work you away for a couple hours because I, I you know. I love, they, that, I love that you. Down for so long. I love that you sound like you really work on that and privilege that like code switch when you walk in the door into a different, like try to put the phone away, try not to, to blur that boundary. I think that that's, that's a challenge. Yeah. It's a real challenge and, and, um, and a really it's a good aspiration. <laughs> I try, I try. And it helps that my partner's not in the industry because I think when everyone's in the industry, people who come and go in your house or your partner, it's normalized. All of this insanity that we live day to day, hour to hour is normalized. And right. like, you know, she's like a CDO for a not-for-profit. So she has a very, I mean, she's literally saving the world. Like she's, that's her job. And so she, they have like HR departments and they have rules around all of these behaviors right. and like how, you know, how you're supposed to live your life. And, and then I look at that and I go, Oh, like that's a, that's how it's supposed to be. It, that's how it is in pretty much every other industry. So maybe wow. we could absorb some of that into our industry so that it's not I like you're, you're doing the best segue ever for So go ahead and introduce Heather. <laughs> <laughs> like that was like as if it was scripted, <laughs> right? But I think that's right. It's like how can we? What I think a question that comes up over and over. So Heather McQuillan again is is the president of Moms in Film Canada, which is an organization that's been in Canada for a couple of years and was started I think four years ago. Um, uh, it's advocacy and lobbying for these issues. Um, and, uh, and I think I would like to open up the, for you to talk, Heather, but also just in general, what should we expect? A lot of people said, should I say that I have a family when I'm in an interview, when I'm in a room? How much should I bring it up? It sounds like the people on this panel have been somewhat lucky and often with each other <laughs> about being able to be open about this, but I certainly have worked jobs where I wasn't, and uh, I'm sure all of you have. So Heather, I'd love to hear your perspective on, on that and also how you got in charge of Moms in Film and then had a baby. <laughs> so, um, so I guess um, the first thing, I, I work um, in set decoration and props. I'm a buyer, I'm a decorator. Um, so I, I work in a little bit different setting than writer's rooms. My husband is also um, in set decoration and props. He works on set with the shooting crew. Um, and I've been fortunate enough to bring my son along with me uh, to work. I've worked on some amazing teams. Um, I would be lying if I said it was really easy and I didn't show up at work sweating um, multiple days or that I didn't have serious issues with breastfeeding and pumping when I first got to work. Um, there's a couple days where I had long production meetings and I, there was milk all over the bathrooms, um, I'm sure after those meetings. So uh, it really, it's been a challenge and it certainly hasn't been easy. Um, I started with Moms in Film, uh, I was expecting, I was about seven months pregnant um, and I was buying. So I was able to keep working uh, and my boss at the time sat me down and told me it was time to um, go home, get the nursery ready and I, I needed to stay home and, and care for my baby now uh, and support my husband's career. Um, so it had never occurred to me before that, that I may have challenges in parenting. I assumed we'll get a nanny, we'll get daycare and everything will just keep running as normal. Um, and it did not. So uh, we looked into Moms and Film. Uh, they were doing great work in the US uh, they had created what they call a wee wagon, uh, which was a childcare facility at Sundance um, to support parents and make sure that they could attend Sundance. And um, we really loved that conversation. Uh, so we opened up Moms in Film Canada. Um, and I mean, really- Banff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wee wagon at Banff, right? 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, we have been working on uh, childcare oh. options for the film industry, like the Wee Wagon for Canada. Um, we just hired on uh, at the beginning of COVID, we hired a childcare logistics coordinator. She is brilliant and has lots of uh, kind of background um, in childcare. So we've worked together to look at what those logistics look like. Um, we're piecing together nannies and daycares for people. We've just started getting our first calls to put daycares, um, daycare spaces into shows that are um, coming back up. Uh, it's amazing. I'm, I'm going to get, I'm going to ask Sarah to put uh, your website in the chat for people. And also Heather was kind enough to provide us with some legal resources uh, for in the United States and Canada. I think uh, it is wildly varies what your protections are um, and what your recourse are if you actually have a problem. Um, but I think the truth is that we all know that, you know, below the threshold where you can have legal recourse, most of these jobs, there's not an HR department, there's not an obvious uh, place to go and complain. And I'm, I'm interested, I actually, it, it's one of those things when I get the question, do you tell people on a job interview that you're a parent? You know, I wanna be like, of course I do. I talk about my kids all the time, but I, I realize thinking about it, that's not always true. Um, I, I think that I have gone into the world with the attitude of like, I'm very upfront about the fact that I have a family and I have kids or whatever. I'm usually pretty snide about it, I would say. Like my cover for all my problems is to be like, you know, like, I, like my kids are feral, which they are. Um, <laughs> But I am really interested in this panel and like what, you know, what people do and, and what we should, what, what we should expect of, of people who are working with us or employing us and what we can do when we are lucky enough to be, you know, in charge. Um, I kind of want to start with Tassie because I feel like there's people here who have worked for you and worked with you and that you've in some way put an openness to family arrangements at the center of your mission and spawns this panel. <laughs> well, I mean, I think, you know, somebody's, I, was it, it may even have been one of you guys said, if you want a good gig on a TV series, work for a, work for a mom, like work for a showrunner who's a mom. Like, yeah. I think that that's, probably universally true like or a parent who an engaged parent I'm not trying to be gender specific but like people who respect and and who value that in their colleagues and their friends and and who see being a parent as a plus in a human being and in a writer and and, you know, I always said that, uh, and it was, this was me being kind of obnoxious in my single days, but I was like, oh, the reason I want to have a child is so I really understand what real, what that kind of love would be as a writer. Like, that's what was always, I was like, I want to, be, you know, know what that would feel like so I can write about it. Like, so obnoxious. But um, anyway, um, I do think that it brings something into your, like, I really value people who have, I mean, I value people with all kinds of experiences, but having kids doesn't make you a worse writer. It, in some ways, it can make you a much more nuanced writer. But I think that, I think for me and my sister, um, our feeling is family first. And we're like, if you have a doctor's appointment, do it. If your kid's sick, stay home. If we're, we're not going to keep inhumane hours, I don't want to work till eight at night, unless it's an emergency. Yes, you will probably end up having to write at night when your kid's asleep or get up early, you're gonna to have to find some solution or you're gonna feel kind of out, of out of the loop. But nobody's expecting you to sit here in some story room for 14 hours. Nobody's, you know, and we always start the story room saying, if you have a weekly therapy appointment, tell us, we'll book it into the calendar. Like if you need, if you wanna to go to yoga at lunch, God bless you. And we'll try to, you know, make sure that we take lunch at the same time or, you know, like, and, and I think that, it's not just because we're so altruistic as as showrunners or producers. It's because it gets loyalty and it gets people's best work. Like if people feel like they're valued as human beings and that their time is valued and that they are supported in on all the things that make us human, um, people will really uh, 
do it, be incredible to work with, you know? Uh, that's I, I I mean I so I, I said your your wife emailed that uh, she said I know for me my kids have been my center I think I realized early on that if they are happy then so am I I loved hearing that I like I wonder <laughs> you're like what <laughs> <laughs> um, oh you're muted um, but I wonder I wonder in in your production and in your production company like how you view other other families or whether you make certain accommodations or think about that when you're employing people? I think, um, you know, it's like dogs, not, not equating children with dogs, um, but it's like a, having dogs in the office, you know, Shiloh, come here. <laughs> you know, it's like, we have like, and I, I think it's like, if you're, come here, come here. Come here. We have like, uh, you know, uh, these kids and they make us more human. And we have our dogs. Hello, say hi. Hi. <laughs> oh my God, dog cameo! Yay! <laughs> there you go. Hello, this is Shiloh. Bye, Shiloh. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, so it's uh, interesting. You're like it's the whole it's the whole person and the, it's the whole person. And I think uh, as a writer, as a as an actor, as a performer, whatever, wh however you're dealing with us, we want all of you. We want the best of you. And I think that you can access. Just as you said, Tassie, when you have this child, you're accessing more of yourself. You're accessing, accessing more of the world. You're a writer of greater nuance when you're actually dealing with this other human being and having gone through the experiences you know, of, of, of trying to have a child and then having a child and then raising a child. I think that all of those things, you're bringing more to the game as an artist. Um, so we try to you know, sponsor that. Like, I mean, when we have our job interviews, we're asking, you know, not just those, you know, five questions that everybody asks. I want to know more about you. So all of those things will help and, and inform, you know, when you're working with us. But in terms of like, you know, going to past eight o'clock in the story room, going past seven o'clock, I frown upon that because it's like, you know, those hours are like just bullshit hours. Like that's like kind of like you're looking at the clock and you know, it's bullshit. As a, I started off as a story coordinator. And, and it was like bullshit, like those hours. I, there was nothing happening. And I, you know, I vowed like back then, like if I have a story department, we're not gonna go like that late. And you know, sometimes we did, you know, sometimes you have to. Um, we did one show and we took a picture like at a, like almost like the ninth episode of a 13 uh, episode run. And we looked at that picture like a couple years later, and like, who are those people? They look <laughs> terrible. <laughs> I, funny, I was I was on a show once where there was three of us who had young children, and when they would say like, there would be a moment where people were like, should we order dinner? And the three parents would be like, and then if we <laughs> order dinner, you knew you weren't going to see your kids that night, right? And and it was one of those weird things where like the uh, it's sometimes the work goes that long and certainly in production as Heather can attest like certainly in production sometimes the hours are long and I love this idea that that rather than hiding it and really compartmentalizing it that the best way that you the way you get people's best work out of them is to embrace that whole the whole true picture of their life and what might be on their mind and what their needs are um like, I don't when think you want to have you, know, everybody, you know, not go to the kid's uh, recital, for example, because that yeah. will come up, right? Like, oh, yeah. if, they're, if they're shooting, it's going to be a problem. But if they're in a story room, what the fuck? You should let them go. Yeah. And it's not a, it was never a question for us because we would not want you to have that guilt uh, of missing your child's event, you know? I think that's amazing. I, also, I think there's a big cultural divide between Canada and the United States maybe on that level, things are changing a lot. I, you know, 10 years ago, I had a manager who said to me, did you really tell someone on the phone that you have a family? <laughs> Don't do that to me. And, uh, and at the time I was like, oh, I'm so dumb. <laughs> Rather than, than realizing like that that was something. Winita, I think you had a comment. Yeah, I guess I just wanted to ask Tassie and Suds because you guys have done the hiring. Um, um, do you, uh, you know, in all honesty, um, do you try to balance those people in your rooms or you work with who might have time restrictions or complications or family life, let's say, 
or whatever it is that they're dealing with, you know, going to the fertility treatments or all the things that you can or cannot accept. Do you try and balance your group with people who have no kids and are, you know, young and eager and working, they'll work for you for fucking 24 hours a day, you know? And because I have found that, I have wondered, I'm just, I've wondered, I haven't found. I've wondered if I'm competing with people who are more um, able to commit 100% to staying there until eight if they fucking have to. And those people are needed. We need, obviously, especially when production is going, we need people who are there and aren't kind of bailing, you know? So I'm just wondering, do you, do you consider that in terms of the people you hire so that you know you've always got somebody, you know, good old John boy over there who can, who can stay? I don't want good old John boy. <laughs> <laughs> Me personally, no, uh, no. I mean, in terms of a coordinator or a writer's assistant, I think those are the hardest jobs in the story room. And I think that the coordinator in particular does have to commit a certain level of being there and being present, being working those hours, turning scripts around like late at night, early in the morning. But I would, if a coordinator was a single parent and they said they could manage it and I'd heard that they were great, I wouldn't, I, you know, I, that's up to them how they manage it. But I wouldn't, I don't try and stack a room with, you know, old Johnny who, who has a wife who doesn't ever have to go home ever. I never think about it right. like that. But on, the flip, on the flip side of that, for me, I feel like I decided at some point, I think it's important to say on this panel, like there were definitely times when I didn't see my kids while they were awake. Certainly when my daughter was little, uh, when I was shooting my movie, there's been times where I had to work late over and over and my kids don't like it as said, said so, so honestly, like they don't like it, you know, and, it, and it's not awesome, but it does balance out, I believe. And I, I sort of decided at some point, I'm going to have this feast and famine model, which is because my work itself, like, will be like all consuming and then not that consuming and then all consuming that I would try to, um, you know, try to try to repair, <laughs> try to try to find that balance in my kid's life as well. And when I could you know, be there for everything and volunteer at school and stuff, if I had those periods to seize them, which sometimes meant, I mean, I, I feel like this manager is like, don't say it on a panel, <laughs> but sometimes it's meant that like, you know, when I'm in development or whatever, I can't take on as much work as I would. And I, because I'm buying myself time to be on a set for six weeks or whatever. Down and, the road. And, and that's my, whenever people are like, how do you balance it? Like, how do you manage it? I'm like, you really don't, unless maybe if you lensed way out and looked at my whole life as a graph of right. time I spent, that the colors would ultimately balance out. But that's the only way I know how to do it. And that it's in some way that's true of everything in my life because of the way the work of this industry, you know, unfolds. It's like, it's also true with organizing my purse. <laughs> And I would say that that balance that you're talking about, where it's like feast and famine, uh, that I certainly, in my experience, found that that was complicated by by co-parenting with 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 a with an ex-wife, where although we we were uh, you know always looking to find you know solutions that worked for both of us, and there was uh, tried to be as amicable as possible. Uh, there was it's a different set calculus, like. If it's your partner, you can say, I'm going to disappear for six months, but then when I come back, you know, I'll pay back or, or, or it's like the money's going to our mortgage. Like, whereas when it's, right. uh, you know, the other, the other parent and you're not together, there's not really any upside for her if I'm going to be really busy. And so that's meant things like, you know, basically not being able to work outside of Toronto because I can't sort of. I have to be here for my my days with my son. Now that's again, this was when he he was younger, and uh, so it's a little bit different now that he's 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 sixteen. But when you know when he was like six or seven, um, that I was I I had to have those times where it's like all in on the show, but it kind of still be acting like I wasn't in order to fulfill my half of the the co-parenting agreement. It was certainly right 
tricky to say the least. I, I mean, that again, that segues into a, a question that uh, came up in the chat, which is how do you stay focused on your career goals and also be ambitious in spite of, you know, schedule as a working parent, which Noelle, <laughs> Noelle, you had like a sly smile. I mean, that's- well, that's I was just remembering, a, <laughs> I was no. remembering a wonderful story where my, so when my first daughter was born, I said to everybody, including my agent, for two weeks, I don't want anyone to call me. I don't want anyone to email me just for two weeks. Let me have two weeks where I just stare at my baby and stare at my wifeish, and we just have this thing that we're doing that's awesome because I know it's going to get nuts later. And he called me to say, I've scheduled a pitch at Bell for the series that you're developing uh, with them. And so, but I'll make it super easy for you. I'll come to your house with a car, pick you up, bring you to Bell, you pitch the show, then I'll have the car bring you home and you'll be gone for an hour tops. And I was like, so much no. I was like, no, I'm not doing that. And he was like, you know, it's going to be really hard to convince because I had a co, I had a partner, a creative partner on the, sh on the project who was totally going to be there and was going to pitch. And so my agent said to me, it's going to be really hard to convince the network that you are worthy of show running if you don't pitch the show yourself. And I was like, well, these are, I mean, these are my boundaries. This is what I said. They know I had a baby, so they're not going to be like, we, and it was, you know, at that time was Trish Williams was the was the exec and I know her. And so I'm like, I'm pretty okay with you going with this other dude to pitch this show. And if they don't think that I deserve to be a showrunner or co-showrunner because I didn't go to the meeting five seconds after my baby was born, I'm okay. I have to be okay with that. And so I didn't go and they ordered the show into development anyway. And they called me immediately to be like, under no circumstances would we ever hold this against you. We completely understand where you're coming from. And so I do feel like you have to check this like fear. Like, I don't think he was trying to be a dick. I just think he was trying to be like, I want you to be able to show run the show if it gets ordered. But I, the only reason I knew I could say no was because I had like Tassie and Semi and Morwin and all these like, you know, powerful like showrunner of a women in my life going like, these are the boundaries you can set. It's okay to set some boundaries sometimes. I wouldn't have learned that if I'd been in another room where it was like being a parent was seen as like a disadvantage in some house, so. I, I have to totally agree that like in, in the end, except for like the odd asshole out there, having confidence that you know how to do your job and, being a parent is part of like what you understand how to do. And also being, I think, open about the challenges of it is that confident stance, I think, is more compelling than any other thing. Like, do you really think I can't run a show when I'm like keeping a household together? I know. <laughs> like, it's, it, I do think that, that, that trying to scramble after the expectations sort of puts you at a disadvantage ultimately. And while not conforming to those expectations might once in a while lead, like lose you an opportunity, it will also self-select your opportunities to the kinds that you can thrive in and be real in. I, I, I in do believe that and it's a, it's a risky attitude maybe to go into the world, but this is a risky profession to go into. So I know everyone in it has some appetite at least <laughs> for taking those big swings. Yeah. In terms of ambition, the question of ambition, I think you really have to figure out what that means for you because it means something completely different to me. To me, the goal is to be in a room surround. It doesn't matter necessarily the money or the credit. It's to be surrounded. It's to, it's, I want to be happy in a room surrounded by people where I can be my full self and, and, and express all of the, facets of my life, including being a parent, including being a queer parent, and not, and it doesn't necessarily, I'm not focused on the climbing of the rungs of the ladder to the next job, to the next job, to the next job, and necessarily, which drives my agent crazy, or necessarily the money. Um, I, I just want, I want my work life to be happy, like my home life. And if one of those is like out of sync, then it, the whole thing comes crashing down. That's so beautiful. I, I am, that's such a, that's really profound, Noel. Um, this is really, uh, I, I'm going to 
I, I know everyone has <laughs> things going into production, which seems amazing to me and stuff to do. So I do want to wrap it up, but um, uh, thank you all for this. It's really, it's inspiring to me and it's uh, incredible to hear. And then I feel like we could talk all afternoon and the questions would keep coming. Um, and as I said, there's a uh, Heather's uh, organization, Moms in Film, I think someone put it in the chat and you can reach out to them and um, and for legal resources as well, which um, I'll try to also uh, post on Facebook some of the articles and uh, resources that were mentioned here today. Does anyone have anything else to say? I know that some of you have to go and can, go to production meetings. Go ahead. Can I say one, just to offer a piece of advice, I would say if you're in a story room and you're you know, not at the top, approach parenting like issues the way you would approach story issues, which is pitch the solution. So if I am going in and saying, I need two hours because we have an IVF appointment or whatever, I then immediately go, but here's what I'm gonna do but I am available until 9 p.m. I will come in early the next morning. Um, so yeah, it's the same thing with the story problem. It's not good enough to go like, that doesn't work for me. You have to find a way to make it work because showrunners just want the work to get done. I don't think generally like your job as a, as a junior or wherever in the room is to make less stress for everybody. So if you come in with a solution to that problem, I think it, it really works wonders. It's an amazing piece of advice. Yeah. And, My and last piece of advice is don't worry about what all the baby gear looks like. You don't need a nice crib. You don't need a fancy, you don't need a fancy stroller. I, I can't believe how much time and energy I wasted trying to be perfect. <laughs> you don't have to feed them vegetables if they don't, you won't eat them. Like, <laughs> My perfection meter is has got like it went so far out the window when and and it's made me happier as a parent, like not trying to be perfect at it. Uh, yeah, and I think I, I, I think I would add to that like just remember, I mean, it's so everyone knows this, but just remember that whatever it looks like on Instagram or you know, in the trades, it's I think it's actually if you peel back the, the, if you peel back the skin on this and see what people's families are really doing, everyone has challenges, everyone's finding creative solutions and kind of cobbling it together. And, um, and I really think that Juanita's uh, observation that maybe one po possible positive to emerge out of this time of pandemic might be that we're seeing a little bit behind that fail right and we're seeing into people's lives and there's more children eruptions on zooms and kids coming into pitches and what my one of my daughters said that's not true while i was pitching <laughs> 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 just like from the off-screen voice or whatever but i you know it might be nice if this if we were able to seize this moment to make a change too um oh, anyone no. else before we wrap up well, I thank you so much, you guys, for doing this and for sharing your insights. And I think someone suggested that we do the Seven Up thing. We need to in seven years we should let our children occupy these squares <laughs> and revisit their childhood. Oh, man. If we dare. Um, <laughs> well, thanks so much, and um, best luck with everything. And I look forward to all your amazing work. Thank you, Sammy. Thank you for moderating. Thank you all. Amazing to see you. I feel like I've just had nice coffee with. I <laughs> know. I love seeing your faces. Okay. Um, I think Thanks that everyone. there will be, uh, Sarah, you can weigh in on this, but um, I think that the there will be a replay or recording available of the panel for those who... Really there will be, and we can um, send it out through Cameron Pictures on Instagram or... Okay, and you can find Cameron Pictures on Facebook and Instagram as well. We'll make sure that it's uh, sent out. Thanks again, and thank you, Heather, from Moms in Film, and thanks, thanks all the you. panelists, and have Bye a wonderful everyone. time. Bye, everybody. Bye.